I appreciate your leniency. I was probably, I need to give you probably an explanation um, about last night. Pastor and I were really looking for a reason to go see that latest movie down in Boise. <laughs> I was sick, man. I never get sick, ever, ever get sick. And when I do get sick, I can always speak anyway because I only come here and be here for about an hour, hour and a half. I can make it. But when you get a stomach thing, it's all over with. It's just terrible. And so I thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to die. Wendy was like, you're not going to die. Suck it up. <laughs> no, did she took care of me, took, brought me broth and all this stuff and took care of me. It was awesome. Some of you brought by crackers and stuff. So, yeah, it was brutal, but I'm back on my feet. So, hey, we're, we're good to go. I want you to open your Bibles up to James. I don't want to keep this... Uh, I want to keep this, the time responsible tonight, um, but I really want you to track with me, um, and you do, actually, you did really well, um, but I do go to churches from time to time, and uh, you see people sometimes, and they'll get distracted, and they'll be talking, and they'll be doing different things, and it's like, at least with, I think, the way that I present, you miss one piece, you're going to end up in, a, in kind of like a wrong direction from where we're going. And it's dangerous for both you and me because I have people end up leaving and saying, well, he said this. I'm like, no, you were inattentive. <laughs> you were inattentive. And so tonight's really huge and uh, kind of want to walk with you. This is such a good study. It was a little bit surprising for me. Probably most of you will already know uh, some of where we're going to be going. But some of you, this might be altogether new. And in 20 years of ministry, somehow I had never realized some of this. So it's really significant. Um, those of you who are just joining us, or perhaps uh, the greatest tool in teaching is repetition, I want to give you just a little bit of a layout. We're going to be in James chapter 2, verse 21, but there's context. <clears throat> and if you've ever watched politics, anything in politics, you know that any, some, when things are taken out of con when something is taken out of context, um, you can make it say whatever you want it to say. So you can take a statement out of context, and it can mean something totally different. So it's important to look at the passage that we're going to look at within its context. James is writing, it's the first letter in our New Testament. Um, he is um, half-brother of Jesus, grew up in the home with Jesus, uh, wasn't a follower of Jesus during his earthly ministry. In fact, if you research that yourself from just reading the New Testament, you'll find that not only James, but the rest of his brothers, um, aside from probably mom, uh, they were not really on the same page with Jesus. In fact, you read in, in John 7, Jesus gets in this outright confrontation with his brothers. They kind of see him as this political figure, uh, figure who's running for Senate or Congress or something, you know, some political position. And uh, at the end of that conflict, Jesus says just, hey, you know, you don't have any idea who I am. James was a part of that group. But something happens to James, probably, you know, if Jesus appeared to you, if your brother appeared to you after death, that may rattle you. And that's what Paul says, that, that uh, Jesus appeared to the disciples, you know, several people, but he appeared personally to James and radically changed his world. He ends up becoming a leader in the early church. And what you may not know is when James wrote this letter, um, he was the man in the early church. He's the head of the Jerusalem council. If you read up to the first you know, 16, 18 chapters of Acts, James was the head. In fact, Paul mentioned several times in his letters, and it's also mentioned in Acts, that when, when Paul comes down to Jerusalem, the first person he meets with, Paul, the first person he meets with is James. And so James is just, just this really significant figure. Well, he's, he's writing this letter, which again is the first letter in our New Testament, and it's written to a church that at the time is almost exclusively Jewish. So there's none of us Gentiles. There's no massive Gentile push really going on. A couple of the disciples uh, of the 12 that are sent, yeah, they had Gentile kind of efforts, but they were like way out there. Like some went to Ethiopia, some go to all these different places. Paul was the one, Paul and Barnabas was the one that really kind of put the push towards the Gentile world and the Roman world of their day. So when this letter was written, it was written to Jews. So here's the deal. It's written to a bunch of people who, who grew up in faith in God, in an old covenant relationship with God. They accepted that Jesus is the Messiah. They still live in a Jewish community with a Jewish law, uh, you know, the Judaism law, the Ten Commandments and that whole system. 
Um, they're, they're meeting at a Jewish worship setting. Um, I mean, they're, they're still Jews. They still go down to the Passover. They still go down to all the festivals. They do all those things. They just accepted that Jesus is the Messiah. And so James is speaking to that group, and he's using all of that Jewish language, trying to define and trying to, to lay out for them that the old covenant is gone and a new covenant has come. That's a lot, isn't it? Okay. Oh, but here's what you need to get. Old covenant is gone. New covenant has come. And when I first studied this, I thought, what in the world does this book have to do with 21st century Americans? You know, well, if you've spent around any time around the church, um, it's amazing what we have reverted back to. I meet all kinds of, of people who claim to be Christian and maybe they are. Okay. But a lot of their language has to do with, it really matches up well with Old Covenant and not New Covenant. It, it matches up in what we describe as an Old Covenant relationship with God, where God is, in the Old Covenant, God was high and lifted up. God is sovereign. God is holy. Um, God is righteous. God is, he doesn't just know the truth. He is the truth. He just, he just doesn't make the decision on what is right. He is right. So God is here, and in the Old Covenant, man was here. And they never mixed. Go look at uh, David's friend Uzzah, who studied the ark and died. No one went behind the veil, because God is holy and man is not. And they never intermixed. So never in an Old Covenant time period did God say, well, hey, no one's like me except for Tom, and Tom's like my buddy. That never was the case. So this is the old covenant relationship with God. God is holy, man is not. And we walked and lived with God. We went to a place where God resided. People still talk like that in church. You realize, I have no problem calling this a sanctuary in the sense that we set this place aside for worship and in there are times when we want to protect this. But when it comes down to it, this is a facility that is no more holy than the local library. Do not hate me. Okay? This is not holy ground. You are holy ground. And I would be under the impression that if this place burned down and you met down at the library, guess what? On Sunday morning, that becomes your sanctuary. Now, I'm not opposed to, but I'm not opposed to saying this is a sanctuary and we've set this aside to be the place where God's going to move. I have no problem with that. But we have to be careful because that can lead to God is there. And when we go there to see God, we've got to be different than we are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That I don't buy. In fact, Paul fights against that over and over and over again. Um, the old covenant idea is that God is over there and I go see him. And he is out there and I'm doing my best. The new covenant idea, and again, that's, this is so crazy because this is where... For 4,000 years, the knee-jerk reaction, this is how they lived. Well, James is writing and saying all of that has changed, and God never was meant to dwell in houses of stone. He was meant to dwell in houses of flesh. And God has invited us into intimacy with him. God has removed that the veil of the temple was torn. And so God wants to dwell inside you and I. So literally, what makes you a Christian is you have God living in your body. Literally. If you're a Christian. If you're not, you're just a good religious person. But not Christian. So what makes you and I holy is not more holy. What makes you and I holy is the holy God lives inside of us and drags us along in his holiness opens our eyes so we see the way he see and sees and feel the way he feels. So we don't, live, we don't celebrate the Passover because the Lamb has come. We don't celebrate Pentecost. We don't celebrate the festivals. This is a touchy one. We're not judged by the law. Those outside of Christ will be judged by the law. The law will never pass away, but the law is like a trampoline that spring, springboards us into Christ. The law was given to reveal sin. The law was not given to produce righteousness. And another way of saying that is, is if you and I could be righteous by living according to the law, then you don't need Jesus. You don't have to come to church on Sunday. You can just go golfing, but not in Emmett most of the time because it's cold. 
But that's the thing. See, we don't, my neighbor, for example, when I was, before I led him to the Lord, I led my neighbor to the Lord this last year. It's awesome. And he would say, I'm not a bad guy, you know. Hey, I don't steal. Because we know that everybody who doesn't steal is a Christian. <laughs> and I don't kill anybody because everybody who doesn't kill is a Christian. Well, no, that's not what we're talking about. The law wasn't just the Ten Commandments. The law was the first five books of the Bible that the law was a part of, the moral law and the sacrificial, traditional, you know, ritual law. So James is writing to a group of people talking about a whole new thing. And get, get this. This is so radical that the law is not only not an option, it doesn't exist. The fact that not only doesn't exist, if you try to go back and worship God through the law, it's idolatry. You should see the looks on your faces. You're like, I'm telling you, man, that's the beauty of Hebrews. That's the beauty of the book of Hebrews. It no longer exists. So there's a whole new deal for you and I with God. A whole new deal. So he introduces this in chapter 1. Chapter 1 of James is that message, and he crushes it. When you come into chapters 2 through 5, now hear this, and you're going to love tomorrow night. But chapters 2 through 5, he talks about all these issues that are springing up in the church of his day. And all of those issues are not, they're not caused by the world. They're not caused by drug addicts. They're not caused by murderers. They're not caused by liberals. <laughs> voting going on today. There, there's, it's, it's not caused by an ungodly Roman world that we have to live in and, you know, wants us to go to Starbucks. Oh, you know. See, he doesn't bring up any of that stuff. All the issues in the church are caused by one group. This group. You're like, what do you mean? It's the group that comes to church that doesn't have this. They've got a form of godliness but deny its power. I want to give you some homework. I want you to go home tonight, and I want you to discover this for yourself. I want you to literally look through every one of Paul's letters. It won't take long. It's always, most of the, except for Galatians, most of the time it's in the beginning. The major opponents to Paul were the, Judas, the Judaizers. Remember that? The circumcision group. Titus chapter 2, verses 10 through, chapter 1, verses 10 through 16, the rebellious people. It's though the major opponents to the movement of God are this. And in our day, we call them religious people. They're not bad, but they don't have his heart. And they think by coming to church and being a good person and, and doing the right things and saying the right things makes them, makes them a Christian that group ends, be, ends up becoming a dead weight that doesn't win towns for Jesus, doesn't win cities for Jesus. They don't have his passion. They don't have his drive. So chapters 2 through 5 are all about that group who are living in an old covenant relationship God where he's out there and he's not in here. Now, as we said, when you come into chapter 2, which is the first issue he begins to deal with, verses 1 through 13, it's the issue of favoritism. Now, again, what is favoritism? On one side, you have how God sees. On the other side, you have how man sees. Now, what's really interesting, the way that man sees is not bad. It's just not the way that God sees. And anytime you don't see the way God sees, it's not God, which means it's back to this. Does that make sense? So you, we've got to have his heart. There's only one standard of good. He's it. And if it's not his perspective, it may not be bad. Here's one of the interesting things. In fact, um, maybe we'll get to this just first, just to get it out of the way. Look, look back with me, and I didn't give you this, sir, but look back with me to verse 16 of chapter 1. And just real quick, he says in verse 16, at the heart of this message, he says, don't get distracted. Your translation is probably going to read like mine. It says, don't be deceived. And the word deceived is actually the word led off. It's not an evil word. It literally, it's almost like someone in the, in the you know, for those who are ADD, it's, it's someone off in the, you know, on the side of the road with a shiny object and we're just, you know, squirrel, and we kind of go off to the side. Okay, that's what distracted is. Okay, it's, they're not evil, they're just distracted. James says, don't, don't get distracted. 
And in other words, don't, listen, don't get sidetracked. One of the greatest things that I find, honestly, that's going on in the church today, I meet very few evil people in church. I just meet people that are distracted. They have no idea why they're here. They're wrapped up into things that are not bad. They're just wrapped into things that are not him. Then they're not a part of the body. They're not involved, and they're not because they're out doing drugs. It's because they're wrapped up in things like football games. And I'm not against football games. But they're wrapped up in things that just, that aren't, you know what I'm saying? There's priorities that are just not his priorities. Their whole life bends and sways, not under his movement, but under what they're involved in. James says, listen, don't get distracted. And he says in verse 17, every good perfect gift is from above. Then he defines above by saying, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. In other words, he defines what it means to be from above. So he's not from above like thank my lucky stars, but it's, it's the one who's from above as being God coming down from the Father of the heavenly light. So he says, listen, every good and perfect gift comes from God. Every good, everything we call good comes from him. Now, I've heard in the church people say, well, what that means is all the good things in my life come from God. And that's true, but that's not what this verse says. What he's saying is, whether you like it or not, whether you would call it good or bad, it, anything that comes from God is good. See the difference? Whether you like it or not, if it comes from God, it's good. You're like, well, I don't like it. Well, yeah, we'll get used to that. Now put these two things together. He says, listen, don't get distracted. If you want to be a Christian, there's a different standard of good that you're called to live by. That's him. That, that's him. And that's the message. So we're not talking about good as like going to church. Because going to church is good. But you can go to church and not come to church. You can go to church and not come to church. You can be here, but not be here. You can give 10% and not tithe. You can sing and not worship. And if you've been around the church any amount of time, I'm sure you've crossed people in leadership where after some time it's revealed that they were here, but they weren't here. And they've got a whole immoral lifestyle going on in their life. This is what he's dealing with. So he's saying, and it's crazy because we're not always talking about immoral lifestyles. We're just talking about people that's not living at the heart of God, that aren't passionate for him. So all of these issues, and I gave you that as a quick illustration, all of these issues in chapters two and three are issues of people that are here, but they're not here. And I'll be honest with you, man, I'm, I, I don't stress about this, but I worry about it with my kids. You know how many preacher's kids I've met who grow up and don't love Jesus? They know when to stand up, know when to sit down, they know all the right answers, but they don't love Jesus. I'm not interested in my kid being the perfect little church kid. I'm interested in him being madly in love with Jesus. I'm interested in her being madly in love with Jesus. That's what I'm into. Well, no one really likes him. I don't care. No one likes me either. But I want them to love Jesus, man. I don't care what they wear as long as it's in line with what Jesus would wear. I don't care the genre of music they sing. I don't care what they, hey, I, I want them to be in love with Jesus. That's the deal. Now, the second issue that he gets into is in chapter 2, as we looked at last night, and we're still going to be in this issue tonight, verses 14 to the end of the chapter, he compares the religious person, which is what we're calling this person, he compares the religious person with the Christian, the authentic Christian. And he, say, he gives you this, he gives you this uh, and it wasn't last night, it was the night before last, I keep saying last night. But he gives this, this um, rhetorical question, and if you remember, rhetorical questions are questions that you ask you already know the answer to. And he says, what good is it if a man claims to have faith, but he doesn't have any deeds? That guy's not a Christian. That's literally what verse 14 of chapter 2 says. James 2, 14. If, hey, if he has faith, but he doesn't have deeds. And remember, we discover, and what faith is, is this. God comes down and lives inside of my body. The Holy Spirit lives in me. The fruit of who he is is being displayed in my life. If you say you have that, and it's so bizarre, but you're not into him. The things he's into, you're not into. What he's passionate about, you're not passionate about. What he's driven by, you're not driven by. Are you kidding me? 
This is a true story. Um, this is a true story. Went too long ago. Uh, it was a while back now. But it was when, I'm not a big football fan, but it's when they had this controversy over his, his NFL and the, and the balls were deflated or something. Do you guys remember that? Do you guys watch football? Yeah, do you guys remember that? I don't watch football. But I'm at the bank, and in Tennessee, it's southern hospitality, it's conversation, it's take your time, which means it's frustrating. <laughs> so I'm in the bank, and in order to curb the frustration, they put TVs up where, everywhere, honestly, in our bank, so you can watch TV while you're going through the bank. Um, and I went in this time because I actually had to speak to the teller. So I'm stuck in the bank, and I'm sitting watching TV, and I'm standing beside this guy, and we end up just standing there looking at each other, so a conversation strikes up. And he's shaking his head, and you know, looking at the screen. I'm like, uh, you know, he was explaining what was going on, and I said, are you, you a football fan? He goes, oh yeah, huge, big football fan. And I said, What's, who's your favorite team? He goes, oh, I don't have one. And I was like, that's weird. I thought that was kind of weird. It's like, you don't have a favorite? He goes, nah. I said, uh, did you, uh, did you, are you going to watch the, uh, you going to watch the Super Bowl? He goes, nah, I probably won't watch it. I was like, you're a football fan? He looks at me, he goes, don't judge me. And I remember thinking, you, he, that guy's a weirdo. That, that's not normal. I think anybody would say that's not normal. But you get away with that in, in church. Or in conversations about Christianity. Are you a Christian? Oh, yeah. Jesus, Mary, Joseph, absolutely. Going to heaven. Woohoo. Where do you go to church? Oh, I don't go. I don't go. Or you've been reading his word. No, oh, I don't read it much. What's he doing in your life? How's he shaping you? Oh, he's not. Not really. I mean, you know, I pray before my meals. Are you sure you're a Christian? Don't judge me. I'm like, you're a weirdo. <laughs> you get away with that. And it's interesting. We claim to be the housing of God that's living inside of us, the heartbeat of him beating it. And yet we're not. Something is wrong with that, man. That's weird. Well, I go to church every Sunday. So does Satan. He parades around like an angel of light. But he is not. Isn't that crazy? I can see you, you agree. <laughs> now, so James is trying to speak to this group of people. This is so neat. This is such an encouragement to us. James is trying to speak to this group of people, and he, he moves down through the passage, and he makes some bold statements. We're going to look at verse 21, but I want you to pause at verse 19. Look at this. And again, this is so crazy because I hear religious people make this kind of statement all the time. In verse 19, he says, you believe that there is one God. Do you know what that means? In a monotheistic world where Jews were the only ones who believed in one God. And they stood out. The Romans scoffed at them. The Greeks made fun of them. Other nations persecuted them. They believe there's one God. So to say you believe in one God means, hey, and he's writing to Christians, is another way to say, I'm a Christian. I believe God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I I'm a Christian. I believe there's only one God. There's not many. There's one God. I'm a Christian. That's what he's saying. So in other words, they have correct theology, all of that. Listen to what he says. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that. See, I've met people say, well, I believe in Jesus. Who cares? That doesn't make you a Christian. Well, hold on. I believe Jesus died and rose from the grave. I believe all that. Who cares? That does not make you. Isn't that crazy? Have you ever, have you ever, that's startling. Well, I believe in God, man. <laughs> You're going to one day for real. Hardcore. I do. I meet people all the time. Oh, hey, I believe in God. That, that doesn't matter. That's, what, that's a typical thing a religious person says when combated with having the heartbeat of Jesus in their life. So how do you deal with a, how do you deal with a, with a group that? And here's why I'm bringing this up to the church today. We live, most of the time, people that 
We don't live in a country where people are anti-Christ yet. We live in a country where people, especially those you're going to run into, people, oh yeah, I believe in God. They, they're not outright Satanists. You, know, you probably don't have very many Satanists in Emmett, maybe, you know, just half of the people or whatever. Okay. But how do you, how do you deal with that, man? How do, you, how do you win a world like that? Listen to what he says. Verse 21, this is what we're going to look at. Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? I found it interesting. I'll give you three quick things. I found it interesting, and I find it interesting, that throughout the New Testament, Abraham is consistently used by writers, not to the Gentile world, but consistently used by the writers when speaking to Jews who have not yet been freed from legalism. Does that make sense? Abraham is the one that they always come back to because, hey, he's the father of them, but he's really, Isaac is the big deal, a child of faith. And you have to ask your question, you have to ask why. Why is Abraham always used? Well, when you go back and look at Abraham, a couple things really stood out to me. First off, did you know, <laughs> this is so cool, did you know Abraham was considered righteous before the law was ever given? Abraham was considered righteous before the Ten Commandments. There were no festivals. There were no commands. He golfed every Sunday. You're like, well, what made him righteous? Not that. This is what made him righteous. He walked before God as his friend. Intimately. I think this is a question that I don't care how old you get. You have to ask yourself. Are you like this with him? I mean, are you real? You know how easy it is as a minister to kind of fall back? Guys like Brian and I, honestly, are subject to this. You get caught into doing ministry all the time. You can do ministry and not be like this. And he and I have talked about stuff like that in the past. You can preach and, and not be like this. James writes to people of his day, and he says, listen, you've got to be tight. And he gives the example of Abraham, who was righteous before the law was ever given. And out of all the examples of Abraham... To speak to this group, he, he picks one particular illustration. And he says, and again, what's he talking about? He's talking about not just having faith, which is God coming down and living inside of me, but letting all of who he is drive me. Some of the language that I've been using on this is that, and if you follow the Lord, if you walk the Lord in any amount of time, there are times where, and I try to tell people this, especially with the word. There are times where passages of scripture come to mind that I didn't go get, that he brings them to mind. Any old timer will tell us young, us young people like that, about that. Those of us who are, you know, 25 and under. Like he brings, he brings passages to mind. There are times where like in the middle of my day, it's like literally... And if it's true that I have another person living in my body and I walk with him and I learn to talk with him, there are times when he's looking through my eyes and for a glimpse of a moment, he will open my eyes to how he sees a situation. And I wish you could see everybody's going, we've been there. That's this stuff. It's different between seeing through his eyes. Wouldn't it be neat to throw my glasses off? It's, it's different between seeing people through his eyes and then looking at people and looking at the scriptures and making a judgment about them. It's a total two different thing. It's a completely different thing. You can live your life like this or you can live your life like this. There's been times when I can't necessarily pin it down on why I'm sticking my neck out for this person, but I just can't help it. 
the woman caught in adultery. You're, you're just not going to get there with this. You're going to get there with this. Because she was flat out guilty. In the law. But unless you're seeing a person through his eyes, this ain't going to make sense. So he takes this guy, Abraham, who existed before the law, and he says, I want you to look at him. Now he picks this really interesting, interesting verse, first off, which, again, Abraham is used all over the New Testament. And it's the issue uh, of, uh, or it's the scene of God coming to Abraham. And I had to go back and read it. Wendy and I, were, I was getting my pointers for my sermon tonight from Wendy. But I, was, I went back when I was studying this, and I was looking at this whole event when Abraham was told to go sacrifice his son, Isaac. First off, there's a number of key passages. Uh, in, the, in the passage, verse 21, it says, was not, our Abraham, was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous? And this is actually a terrible translation because the word considered is not even there. It's literally, was not our ancestor Abraham made righteous? Meaning that, he did not earn it. He did not achieve it. It's literally in the midst of this relationship, God came down and said, wham, you're right. So what righteousness is, is not how it turns out. It's motive. It's all motive. It's heart motive. You're not judged on how well you do something. You're judged on the heart motive, which means God leads and I respond. I'll give you a great example of this. Um, and by the way, this is all over, especially the Old Testament. One of my favorite Old Testament guys is, um, is Jonah, which I didn't know much about Jonah, again, until I did a, a really in-depth study on the guy. God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh. And Jonah's like, no way. Nineveh's like California. No, I ain't going. I ain't moving there. In fact, people are fleeing there here. I'm not going to California. God says, go to California. I mean, go to Nineveh. Jonah says, no. Nah. I'm going to Hawaii. So he gets into a boat and he starts heading for Hawaii. Jonah could have made it to Hawaii, converted the whole island and the surrounding islands of Hawaii to God. And he would have died and went to hell. Because it isn't about all the good things that he did for God. It was about God's plan for Jonah. And God said, I initiate, you respond. Go to Nineveh. By the way, as a side note, and I didn't know this, you guys probably already know this. Did you know that, Jenna, uh, that Jonah went there to lead them to the Lord and called them to repentance? Did you know that he never left Nineveh? That he lived there to his dying days and a memorial there? And there's a whole history. I didn't know that. Did you know that? I didn't know that either. They don't teach that stuff at NNU. No, 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 no. Shade off NNU. <laughs> they don't teach it at all of that either, I don't think. Probably, probably Trevecca because it's in Tennessee. But, but he stayed there. And so it, it isn't just about, this is the, it's, it, it isn't just about doing good things. It's about doing God things. It isn't just about being moral. It's about being him. There's a difference between not doing anything bad and being used by him. Isn't that interesting? So what if Christianity wasn't about good and bad? God comes to Abraham and he doesn't tell him where to go. He says, follow me. I'm going to lead. You're going to respond. That's the deal. I'm going to live in your life. I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to give you a perspective. I'm going to shape how you feel. All I want you to do is respond. I'm not interested in you going out and doing things for me. Let me take you where I want to lead you. In fact, and I don't want to go back and delve through it, but when you go, we looked at verses 16 and 17 of chapter 1. If you look at 18, he says, he begins by saying, don't get distracted. There's a new standard of good. Then he says, he chose to give us birth to make us of a kind of first fruits. The word chose is, is, there's a couple different words in the New Testament for chose. This word means planned, which means he planned for you. 
when I got saved, I looked up in the Bible because someone had told me my name was in there. And I grew up hating the word, the name Jeremiah because of the, the band with the song. And, and it was just an old-fashioned name when I was growing up. You know, I just didn't like the name Jeremiah. I wanted to be named like a masculine, cool name like Brian or, uh, <laughs> you know, something really cool and popular, you know. But I was stuck with Jeremiah. But when I got saved, I looked in there and I was like, whoa, there's a book in there with my name on it. Wow. Take that, Brian. And so I begin to read through this book, and God comes to the prophet Jeremiah, calling him to go somewhere that he was not intended to go, and, God, and Jeremiah is all scared to death, and God says, listen, before you were born, I knew you, and I appointed, you know what appointed means? Chose. It's that word. Before the foundation of the world, I have a plan for your life. I chose you. Now, Jeremiah could have said, nope, doing my own thing. I'm going to make you proud. What if fitting in the plan of God is not just doing good things, but saying, God, why do you have us here? Why did you erect this place for this hour? I want to be involved. Because I think just keeping our nose clean and showing up to church and making sure I don't, you know, drink, smoke, or chew, or go with girls who do, and I don't lie, and I don't steal, I don't think that's enough. I don't, I don't think that's enough. I think there's a plan and there's a mission and that God has sent you the leadership that you have for such a time as this. This is, what, this is the whole thing with Abraham. God said, get your boy. This is so good. God says, get your boy, take him to the mountain where I want, him, where I want you to go. And I want you to sacrifice him there. Abraham's got all these questions along the way. God's like, don't worry about it. I'll take care of everything. It's interesting it's interesting in that when you reverse those roles, you end up, if you go look, by the way, Abraham was asked to go sacrifice his son. When I first read that as a young Christian, I was shocked. And first I was, because God does all this off the wall stuff. You know, he's like, you know, just start walking in the water and it'll part. <laughs> you know, strike that rock a couple times. You know, go out and you'll have some manna that's going to come up. And he's got all these bizarre things that he says. One thing I didn't realize, in our culture, all, being all, you know, sacrificing your child, your firstborn son would be huge. Did you know that that was, I did not know this, this is so good. Did you know in, in Abraham's day, in the religions that he was associated with, that was the most extreme measure of worship that you could offer to your God? Listen to this. It's not uncommon. Oh my goodness, hold on here. Listen to this. In fact, God mentions this several times. In the book of Leviticus, he says, do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to foreign gods. For you must not profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 12. The Lord, listen to this. The Lord your God will cut off the people before you of the nations you're about to invade and the lands you're going to possess. But when you have driven them out and you've settled in their lands and after they've been destroyed before you, be careful. Don't be ensnared by inquiring how they worship their God, saying, how do the nations serve their gods? We're going to do the same. You must not worship the Lord your God in their way, because by worshiping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire sacrificed to their gods. And there's ones in, in 1 Kings, there's some in 2 Kings, there's, there's several in First and Second Chronicles where the kings, the kings of Israel did that. So when God, get this, when, this is so cool, when God comes to Abraham, he basically, in his little religious context, he says, I want you to show me how much you serve, how important, I want you to go sacrifice your son. That way it wasn't just out of the box, kind of out of, that was something that he knew. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't complain. In their culture, before the law came, before Moses, before all that stuff, the lands around them, that's how they worship their God. 
Abraham goes up, binds his son, raises the knife, and God intervenes. And when God intervenes, you say, why does he intervene? Well, God's new pattern is I, I lead, you respond. The pattern is not I respond or I lead God, you respond. And I'm telling you, when you get into this kind of relationship with God and God's out there and I'm here and I'm doing my best, you get into manipulation. Uh, fasting, for example. I'm a huge fan of fasting. But I'm a fan of fasting as long as it's not a manipulative tactic to get God to do something you want. Oh, I really want this job. been fasting about it. I've got a problem with that. See, if I just believe, God will respond. If I just believe, God will... Last January, I was in um, North Carolina at a revival in Oaks, North Dakota. North Carolina. North Carolina. I get a call from my wife. And she says, I'm 10 days late. I probably should put emotion in that. It was not, I'm 10 days late. It was the other way around. And that's really difficult because I can't be like, well, what did you do? <laughs> way to go. I became the most spiritual man in all of North Carolina. Fasting, praying, promises, <laughs> sackcloth, which was burlap. That's the only thing I could find at the tractor supply. I mean, I, 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 dude, I was like, I made vows of celibacy that would last for years, whatever it would take. We do that, don't we? See, when you get caught up into when you get out of the idea that God is leading, God is guiding, and that I'm following you, and you've got a plan, and I'm praying for your heart to move, and I do have petitions, but hey, I'm trusting you. It's a whole different deal when God is out there, and I'm here, and I make it to church on Sunday, and I'm not a bad guy, and I really, I don't bug you very often. I hear that all the time. You know, God's got a lot of things going on. I don't bug him very often, just when I need him. You'd say, well... What's the whole deal? Why does God pick Abraham? God's saying, listen, I lead, you respond. You don't lead, and then I respond. Because God has a plan. And I, I told Wendy this tonight. I'd never known this. I don't know how I got through college without learning this. You'd say, well, what was that whole thing about? What was God doing? <laughs> the mountain where God told Abraham to go was Mount Moriah. I did not know this. You know where Mount Moriah is? You know where Mount Moriah is? I didn't know where Mount Moriah is. You know where Mount Moriah is? It's a certified, where, where's it at? Would you say Colorado? It's not in Colorado. <laughs> I didn't know. I ask people all the time, you know where Mount Moriah is? A buddy of mine, C.B. Glidden, pastor, and, and, and his wife and family, and his church, they took a trip to Jerusalem this last year. Mount Moriah is right on the edge of Jerusalem. I didn't know that. And on the side of Mount Moriah is a, is a have become for Christians, a very hollowed place called, anybody know? Galgatha. Put this together. God, 4,000 years before Jesus was even born, takes Abraham to the place where he's going to sacrifice his own son and says, sacrifice your son. And then he interrupts him and says, no, I'll provide the sacrifice. And he was talking about Jesus. Get this. See, the whole I lead, you respond thing, God wasn't, and this gets so self-centered that it's so easy for churches to get so inward. All the things that God wanted to accomplish through Abraham were not for the sake of Abraham. Abraham never received any of that stuff. All of his descendants did. Abraham never seen any of that stuff. Well, then what in the world was he doing? Abraham was allowing God to use him, not for his own benefit, but for the benefit of an entire world. I meet churches once in a while that have trouble in investing things that don't benefit them. They have trouble getting on board with things that don't benefit them. 
See, what if everything that was laid here and what you guys have, and by the way, I've had to surrender that to the Lord because every time I come here, I covet your building. In fact, I sometimes pray, would you just let everyone here die <laughs> so we can take this to Tennessee? That would be such a blessing, Lord. I mean, most of them are old anyway, so just let, let us, we could just, they could die, then you could take them home, and then I could, that isn't uncouth, is it? Is that uncouth? Is that, is that rude? What if this entire blessing was not for your benefit, but for the benefit of... What if we structured our worship so it wasn't to our benefit too, but it was for their benefit? What if everything going on in the church wasn't to best suit how we wanted it, but it was best to be salt and light for the... I've asked, I've asked grandparents this. I've asked, what would you do in order to get your grandkids to come to church? And they say, Anything. Anything but conflicting with the message. Anything but compromising the message. Anything but betraying the message. I'm in. Whatever it is. Doesn't have to be about me. Eternal purgatory in the nursery. I'll do it. I'll do it. Seriously. What, what if that's our call? That's the difference between a religious person. I'm not bad. Just hanging out, waiting for Jesus to come back. I don't. I do. That's not Christian. What's Christian? Literally, sacrificial living filled with the heart of Jesus till God can produce through me whatever he wants to produce through me to win that world. See, I envisioned you jumping up and running around. And hallelujah. I, when I was playing this in my mind tonight at, at Brian's house, like, they're going to go nuts, man. They're going to be throwing brownies. I mean, they're going to be flying around the room, going crazy, breaking hips. I mean, they're going to be absolutely. That, that, seriously, that, I, I think that's what we're called to. And, I mean, I, I, uh, I'm called to this in Tennessee. I mean, They're hillbillies in Tennessee, man. I'm from Indiana. I am. I'm from Indiana. I talked to several of you from northern Indiana. Who's the couple I talked to is from northern Indiana? Oh, they skipped. Um, but oh, they're not here tonight? Bowling? No, I'm teasing you. I'm teasing. You know I'm talking about, though. And we, we come from the same town. They're, they're from Plymouth, I think. Yeah, sweet couple. I, I'm, I'm an Indiana boy. I mean, all my family's in Indiana. But God planted us in Tennessee. And I'm going to die over one thing, and that's the message. And the message is this. The message is this. And however that is articulated, I do not care. I don't care what style of music, as long as it's like this. I don't care about clothing as long as it's like this. I don't care about activities as long as it's like this. I, I, I'm serious. I literally don't care. Whatever they're into, Paul said, I become all things to all people. That, that's what, I, I think that's what we're called to. James is writing to a religious group of people saying, listen. And then he gives them Abraham. Tomorrow... Tomorrow I want to look with you out of uh, chapter 3. And it's about spiritual warfare. And you can read ahead. It's James chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. And it's fascinating. The most significant aspect of spiritual warfare in his language is your mouth. Your church will fall or thrive by your mouth, what comes out of your mouth, what you speak over a person. And this is what you and I were talking about today. It's amazing what you speak over a person shapes their, that whole junk about sticks and stones, I don't know who came up with that. A Satanist came up with that, that's what happens. But you literally shape someone by your speaking. Speaking life over them. So we're going to talk about that tomorrow. But I encourage you. Um, I think, and I'm just, I'm just, I'm a nobody. But uh, I tell you, uh, I think I'm free to say this. I sensed something a little different this time when I was here than last time. 
you seem healthy and happy. You're still very stoic, but you're, you're, you're pretty happy. And so I would be absolutely thrilled to see what God's going to do with you in the future. Just If you could just get on board with what he wants to do for this community, it would be phenomenal. Jesus, we love you tonight, and we thank you for the truth of your word. Father, I pray that you would... I pray that you would speak to us tonight, Lord, and if I could guide us in kind of a corporate prayer. And I'm under the authority of of Brian, who's who's your pastor here, Lord, but... And I believe he and I are on the same page. And if I could pray for this body like I would pray for my own, in the name of Jesus, we come out of agreement with any motive that is not yours. We come out of agreement, Father, as a body, we we collectively come out of agreement with any agenda in this church that is not yours. We come out of agreement with any mission and strategy that is not yours. In the name of Jesus, we come out of any agreement with the enemy, with with an attitude, with a nature, with passions that are not yours. And we repent of those in the name of Jesus. We we, We come out of agreement with any known or unknown kind of the language is difficult Lord but maybe demonic or ungodly kind of stronghold that that was operating in Emmett we just come out of agreement and we stand against that in the name of Jesus and father I just if I could lead Emmett tonight we want to come into agreement with your heart for this city we want to we want to come into agreement with your passion we want to come into agreement with your your motive and your plan and your will Jesus, we spiritually want to come into agreement with your heart for this city. That we might be the expression of your hands and your feet and your heart and your motive. That our, that our own petty desires and uncomfortable things might be set aside for the sake of what you want to accomplish in this town. We, we want to be used by you, Jesus. And Father, it says where two or three are gathered together in your name, in agreement with you, revival happens. People are not going to be attracted to Bible study. They're going to be attracted to a movement of God. They're going to be attracted to a place where they feel loved, where there's excitement, and there's a bubbling of the surface and something's happening down at that church. God is alive there. God is doing something there. And we just pray that here tonight, Lord. We just want to come into agreement with you want to give you that kind of authority and kind of reign in our heart so we love you this evening Jesus we're going to gather together as a family tonight and we're going to eat some food protect us from food poisoning Jesus I beggeth thee in the name of Jesus and let us enjoy each other's company these times where we gather together they don't happen enough so we love you Lord and we praise you we ask these things in your name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Appreciate you being here. If you don't poison me tonight, I'll be back tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. And we've got a variety of food, and some of you have brought things in, and we appreciate it. And I appreciate you having me. Brian and Wendy and the family have been so, they've been so gracious to me. So you can thank them. And, and uh, they've been good to me. Well, let's gather together for some, uh, for some fellowship time. Is that fair enough, Brian? Can we do that? All right. See you tomorrow night at 7 o'clock.